Hello, I'm glad you all could join us. I'm Danielle Walker, reporter at SC Magazine, and I'm here to welcome you to today's webcast entitled Mitigating Employee Risk, Keep Hires from Starting Fires. This session is sponsored by SpectreSoft. Our speakers today are Mike Tierney, COO of SpectreSoft, and Dominique Colterra, VP of Human Resources at the company. During their presentation, they'll provide a practical approach to managing and monitoring employee access, and they'll also highlight tips for screening potential hires, as well as efficient methods for granting access and permissions based on job roles. This webcast will also delve into ethical and legal considerations that arise when dealing with or preventing insider breaches. Um, with that, I'll let Mike kick things off. Well, thank you, Danielle, and uh, thank you to everybody that's taken some time out of their busy day to join us today. Um, we're, we're glad you're here, and hopefully, you know, my goal whenever we do these is to uh, hopefully be, you know, a combination of informative and entertaining. So we'll, we'll see how we do on that. Um, I don't have a technical problem here advancing the slide. You guys could you bear with me for one second or for a great start? I don't know why it's not working. There we go. I think I might have figured it out. I think I'm a Mac guy living in a Windows world. So there we go. Um, and I apologize for that. It won't happen again. So now, with, without any further ado, you're, you're looking at some, some statistics and a little bit about SpectreSoft. And, um, you know, I, I wanted you to have a feel for who we are and what we do. And, you know, in addition to the words up on the screen there, you know, I can tell you that um, over 7,000 companies have deployed, have deployed our flagship product, um, and we have deployments that range from, you know, a handful of licenses up into the tens of thousands. And we've recently won a couple of awards we're rather proud of, um, Best Fraud Prevention from SC Magazine and a Best Security Solution at the Interop Show. Um, and I thought it just might be interesting to very quickly go over um, why our customers are our customers from the perspective of what problems we help them solve. Um, and there's really three main areas that people come looking to us for help. Um, the first is productivity. You know, very quickly, are our employees working hard enough? Or are they working smart enough? The second is employee investigations. They're a fact of life. Companies need to confirm or deny something. It could be anything from an HR issue up to, to full-on crimes that are being committed, and we're very frequently used for that. And the third, and the one we're going to spend some time on today, is security. And within that security use case, um, we help people to detect, detail, and deter insider threats. Um, you know, we may touch a little bit on investigation a bit as we talk about security because they go kind of hand-in-hand hand often. Um, but that's just a quick overview of who Spectrosoft is and what we do. Um, so before I uh, introduce Dominique here and ask her to, to help us take a look at the employee life cycle and how risk can be managed and mitigated throughout, just for the, for the folks that are here, I have worked for, with Dominique for uh, a long time, many years. Um, there's more gray in my beard than there was the day she met me. Um, and if there's any folks on the line here who have kind of decided that HR is about benefits questions and planning the holiday party, this is a good time to listen up because that is not at all what Dominique's about, and I think you're going to get some, some really great insights from her. So, Dominique, thanks for joining me, and, and here we go. Thanks, Mike, and thank everyone on the phone. Uh, today's topic, mitigating employee risk and keeping hires from starting fires. Um, we'll, we're going to talk about the employee risk through three phases of the employee life cycle, the beginning, the middle, and the end. There are really two phases to the beginning of the life cycle. It's a pre-hire and post-hire, one informing the other. Um, this is The pre-hire is also your recruiting stage. Um, it's a stage that determines the fit of the person to the culture, to the team, and the company, and more importantly, the position and the risk associated with that position. But before you even con consider the person for the job, you really need to consider the position and the risks associated with that. You need to determine this before you start the recruitment process. I think that's an important point, Dominique, that we're talking about positions as opposed to people, because I think sometimes people get a little rattled when you start thinking about the people at this stage of the game. So I think that's a great point. Right. Thanks, Mike. It is definitely before you even speak to the first person, you're really looking at the job requisition and you're looking at the job description. Uh, the position is defined by both of those and are typically created by the hiring manager. At this time, it's also where we find out what systems and information that's needed 
And this is really the stage is where we dis assess the risk. Uh, there's other factors involved. For those of you out there, 77% of employee fraud is found in six areas. Accounting, operations, sales, customer service, purchasing, and upper management. Um, that was done by the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. Yeah, and that, that's a good group. And I think, you know, that's one of the things that's important. You know, you, you mentioned other factors in fraud. And, you know, a lot of times people, people think about um, insider risk and it's all about data leaks. But there's a lot of other things to talk about, too. And fraud's a great example. Um, that same report that, that I think that stat comes from, you know, I think a lot of people will look at, say, well, accounting and, well, external auditors. It's their job to, to detect fraud um, if that's going on inside a company and particularly inside accounting. Um, only 3% of fraud reported gets caught that way. Um, and, you know, auditors historically have not done a great job in limiting loss. And that, you know, that, that information is also from the, from the same report, the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, from their report to the nation. Um, it's a great resource if anybody wants to go out and take a look at it. Okay. I mean, we look at it, this needs to be simple and a common sense approach by utilizing the requisition and the job description. Every position has risk. We all know that. Um, I'll give you an example. Reception, uh, a reception person. First impression is absolutely critical. They are dealing, the, you know, firsthand of the customers and potential prospects that will go away if they get a fast, you know, a bad impression. That is a risk, but it's on a low risk if you're, you know, scaling on a one to ten. But then, you know, look at someone who's highly privileged with lots of access or they're a highly privileged user, what about if they decide to steal? That is a higher risk level, hard to detect. It's going to have a, it's going to have a greater risk level above seven. Yeah, and I think the, the point that, that, that you made there, it's a harder to detect, right? If, in the example you used, the, the receptionist who, you know, if, if you have somebody with a bad attitude, potentially turn customers off, we are going to overhear them or a sales guy is going to get a complaint and you're going to know pretty quickly and be able to mitigate it as opposed to like a highly privileged user that can be very insidious and difficult to go in and figure out, you know, what they're doing. And when we say highly privileged root user, you know, I think that gets talked a lot about in times and people hear that and think about system admins, but it's not just you guys, right? We're, we're talking about, quite frankly, we're talking about people like me. When Dominique was going over the uh, the six areas before, I was kind of taking notes and operations, and I put a little check next to me, and sales, and I have, um, you know, the inside sales team here rolls up to me, and upper management, I went, boy, I'm a, I'm a pretty risky guy. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's not just the guys that are uh, that are working on the systems out there. Well, as we're looking at during the pre-hire stage, we've got the different risk levels. Okay. The risk levels are associated with the position really helps dictate and drive some action items. Those action items would include who will be involved in that screening, the interview process, what level of background checks. Realistically, that depends on their role. Not all jobs are a background check the same. You know, you may have a corporate controller who has fiduciary, you know, um, uh, access versus a salesperson or a marketing person. It's going to really drive your background checks. But those would already be determined, again, during the job rec, during the job description. Okay? Um, and then what agreements does that candidate, what would they be required to sign? Your IP agreements may be different for a person in R&D versus a salesperson or a marketing person or a human resources person. Um, but we're all, you know, assessing uh, risk or assigning risk. We're all doing this, and, mo and for some, it's done informally. Um, but, again, the vast majority of the companies complete that pre-hiring uh, with that screening, and then that's it. But the real question is, how many are doing it consistently? Is it documented? Is it communicated and translated into those action items? And that's really the most important thing of what we're going to drive here today is that. Yeah, those are great points. So I think we have a, uh, I think we have a poll for everyone here, um, and, it, and it's related to what Dominique was talking about. So you know, we'll put that up there. And the, and the question is, does your company assign a formal risk level or rating or score, whatever term you might use, to all the positions in your company? And you know, I think there's a difference between the informal 
or, or you know, I don't want to say casual, but I think informal is the right word, way that companies do this commonly now, and it is done in the ways Dominique just described um, in looking at how we're going to screen someone before they bring them on board. But it, or, so or, are you folks doing it in a more formal way than that is the question. And we'll give it a minute here. It usually takes a, a little bit of time for some results to, to come rolling in. And so, so there they are. So 70% no and 30% yes. And, and Dominique, I wonder, what did you have a prediction on that? I would say that looks about right. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to admit to being a little surprised that as many as 30% of people are doing this, and I think that's great. Um, that was a little bit higher than I, than I expected to see. It would be interesting to know if, it, if it's the larger corporations that are answering to the 30 or is it the smaller corporations? Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so let's, let's proceed with Vernon. Thanks, for everybody, for doing that. So, so Dominique talked about, um, you know, assigning this risk level and being consistent with it and documenting it, but I thought the key, one of the key points she made was translating it into action. Um, and that's, the, uh, that's what we wanted to look at a little bit here. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, things like, well, assigning formal risk levels to all positions and assessing positional risk sound very complicated um, and potentially difficult to do. But, you know, I, I don't think this needs to be that. I think this can be a very simple, common-sense approach, you know, given that you have information um, about the position, the resources that people in that position are going to have access to that can help you assign the risk. And before we look at, um, you know, go any further, you know, there's a note up on the screen that says people tend to complicate things they don't want to do. And uh, an attorney that I used to work with had, had told me that some time ago, and it stuck with me. Um, and I think this is one of the areas where we can see that. And it, and it goes back to, you know, remembering that we're talking about positions here. Um, we're not talking about people. We're talking about the positional risk and what's associated with that. And I think a lot of times people will look at, We'll look at the people in positions and start to complicate things and say, I don't want to call them a risk or, or something like that. So it's a, I thought it was an interesting observation he made to me some years ago, and I thought I'd pass that on. Um, so, you know, what we have up on the screen now is just a really, um, you know, perhaps overly simplified four-step process for assigning a risk level. Um, and it starts with reading that job description, because that job description is going to tell you what the person's going to be doing, what the position is responsible for, um, and what accesses they need. Even if it's not formally written down, you can take a look and say, well, somebody in marketing is going to be accessing these marketing things, and, and the, the controller position will be accessing these types of drives and this type of information. Um, so, so you have the information needed to, to begin to assess the potential for damage if a person in that position were to go you know, off the rails a little bit. And that can help you spit out, you know, again, it can be, it can be done any number of ways, but it can be very simple. You can do, use a 1 to 10 scale and, and simply say, you know, a high-risk position is a 10 and a low-risk position is a 1, and then we have some positions in between. It can be, it can be a very simple um, process to do. And then I think that step four, the communicate that risk level, is, um, is probably the, uh, the, the most important one here. Because if you, if you go through that exercise and, uh, and do all this work, but you don't let anybody know what the positional risk is inside the company, it's tough to deal with. Risk needs to be understood before it can be dealt with. Um, so I, I believe every company should look to implement a process, you know, of assigning formal risk levels. And I think there are, there are certain groups of stakeholders that need to be at the table when that happens. Um, you know, and I, and I may use these terms interchangeably on the webinar here, but, you know, we're talking about IT or IT security, depending on the size of your company and who's responsible for the network security and the information security in the company. Um, we're certainly talking about HR. Um, they need to be able to speak to the, to the potential impacts inside the company, the cultural risks. And HR is really the group that's really um, – they bridge between the company and the employee more than any other group. And they're the ones that are most apt to know, is this being done consistently, which is very important. Um, you're going to want to have legal folks at the table because there are, there are questions you're going to want to make sure you have answers to. And we'll touch on these a little bit later, but they certainly include making sure employees are notified um, that online activity may be reviewed or monitored if you decide to go down that road as part of your strategy. 
And then you're going to want to have senior management at the table because you're going to want their buy-in and their support to do this. So I think you need, um, you know, certainly representatives from those, from those four groups. And Mike brings up an interesting point because we look at these different groups working together. So you have to ask yourself, do I have that relationship with these different groups to be able to protect the best interest of the company? Because realistically, that's what we're all looking to do is protect the interests of our organizations, its assets, and its people. Yeah, well said. Well said. So moving forward, um, let's let's play this forward a little bit, and and you know we, we've. We've decided that we're going to install a process like this for the 70% of, of you that don't have it. And you, you, you have the meetings, you bring the stakeholders together, you install a process, you assign your risk levels to positions. You're feeling pretty good about that, and it is an excellent step. But is that it? Is that, is that what you do? And this is where we kind of transition into that, the post-hire phase of the beginning of the employee life cycle. Um, and this is an area where where IT and IT security has traditionally shined, right? Um, they do a great job of making sure that the position has the resources it needs to do its work, right? And that it doesn't have resources that it doesn't need to do its work, right? We're talking about least privilege and making sure that, that we don't have permissions run amok. Um, and, and does a great job, IT security does a great job of making sure that systems and information are protected and secure against unauthorized access. And that word unauthorized is probably the key word on this slide because what we're talking about here um, goes a little bit beyond uh, making sure that you have the accesses you need and don't. Um, you, we need to start looking at what about the people that have authorized access? Are they using it the way that they're supposed to or the way that we hope they are or the way we intend them to? And I think you know, that, that hope word is, is kind of the key word. A lot of times, um, we bring someone on board, we put them through the screening process and some of the things that Dominique talked about. Um, we bring them in, and then we say, well, we're going to trust our employees, um, and we hope that that's the right thing to do. And you know, that hope and trust are not a great strategy for keeping information secure. And I think it's tough for folks who may know the applicant or may know the hire because they were a referral. So that hope is stronger in the sense that they will not actually do something. But the, at these time of days, you really can't take a chance because you don't know what's going on behind the scenes and their mm -hmm. personal lives and things of that sort. No, and, and you know, that's an excellent point. And, and, and this is where that kind of position risk and how we talked about earlier that we're talking about positions where this starts to, to blur a little bit or separate a little bit, and there's position risk, and then there's insider risk or employee risk. Um, and we're able to, to assign an initial, initial risk level based on the position, but now we're talking about bringing in a human element, right? And there are human facts that we have to add to the positional facts, and I think I'm coining a lot of terms here, um, to see how that risk level may change over time. So, um, Another interesting time for a poll, so we'll, we'll jump into it. And the, and the question is, for the folks on the phone, and this is probably mostly aimed at the 70%, once someone's hired and brought on board, do you think a company should just simply trust them to not exceed or misuse their access? Um, you know, so w once you hire an employee, is, is, is the right answer or the, the methodology that you favor simply trusting that you've made the right choice and nothing's going to go wrong? And while we're, uh, while we're waiting for results on that, Dominique, let me, let me ask you a question from an HR perspective. If you, um, someone that you screened and hired and, and took through the process and brought them on board at some point down the road were to go off track and cause a problem, would you see that as a failing on your part? No, because things happen after someone's hired. I mean, we have inevitably have seen it. Again, we bring up the human factor. Um, things change in individuals' lives, um, and unfortunately, that's not predictable. So we don't want to take that chance. Trust, you know, just simply trust that it's okay. Um, Mike uh, shared a great example with me recently that, you know, do you really trust and leave all of your HR, you know, cabinet unlocked for someone and just say, okay, only go look at your own employee file? And, you know, would you really trust that, and do you have that in your own company? Do you have that unlocked cabinet where people can just go to their own? Yeah, no, I, I think it's a, 
it's a good, you know, almost a, a little sanity check for are we employing trust as, as a strategy? And, and if you are, you probably, you know, everybody has the same permissions. Um, so that's good. That's about the, um, that's, those are about the results I was expecting. Um, so, um, so again, thank you to everybody there. We see 91% um, say that no, you can't just simply trust people. And I think that that's, uh, at least in my opinion, a pretty, a pretty informed uh, position to take. So let's, let's, let's look at what some experts say um, kind of on, on this subject or at least related to this subject. So um, the people at Carnegie Mellon, the, the CERT Insider Threat Institute, do just do some outstanding work. Um, I love reading their stuff. Um, I encourage everyone here that's worried about insider risk or insider threats to take a look at some of the stuff they put out. But, you know, up on the screen here is kind of their definition of a malicious insider threat. And there is a difference between um, inadvertent problems and malicious problems. And we're, we're going to stay focused on the malicious here today. And, you know, what that says in more words than I, than I typically use when I speak is that the insider threat, the malicious insider threat, is somebody that's been given proper access and uses it improperly. Um, so that's really what we're talking about here. Um, and that you know that would be an area where a trust strategy would not would not uh, pay off in the long run. Um, you know another interesting uh, interesting quote I came across is from the FBI, um, and I think this speaks to kind of what we were talking about a little bit earlier. When you when you have someone with that proper access, um, it makes it harder to detect when they're doing something wrong because a lot of the the controls and safety measures that you put in place have been defeated by granting them access. Um, so that, that makes it kind of harder to detect, and it's going to give them the ability to do more damage than if they were somebody trying perhaps to, to break into something that they were not supposed to be into as opposed to have access. So, you know, given these facts, you know, the, the question is what do we do? We, you know, we've established, I think, as a group, you know, through the poll question, that we don't just trust um, but I think we need to look to trust and verify, or trust but, but verify, I think is the old Russian proverb. Um, and no, I cannot translate it into Russian. Um, so so how, what's a way that we could do that? Well, we talked earlier about um, translating uh, the information that we learned during the pre-hire process and through the job descriptions into action. And this is a great opportunity to do that. If we've gone to, through the process of assigning risk levels to positions, we can now translate them into action. We can say, based on these risk levels, we have to have appropriate levels of scrutiny. And I think that's an important word, appropriate. Um, it should be aligned to the risk, right? So if we had this type of formal risk score, it's going to make it pretty easy for us to figure out how much scrutiny do we apply um, to these different positions. And as a general rule of thumb, the greater the access, the greater the need to review what's happening with that access. Another guy that I used to work with a long time, um, a long time ago, you know, told me, Mike, you always inspect what you expect, um, and if you don't, you're at risk. And I think that resonates here. You know, if we've given someone access to fill in the blank, we should make sure that that access is being used properly. Um, so I think that's a, a a good beginning plan. And I think if you're looking at um, ways of applying scrutiny and and making sure that that people are doing what they're supposed to be doing with their access, you can look at, um, there's different, let, let's face it, there's different ways to monitor people's activity, and there's different types of tools out there. Um, we at Spectrosoft are obviously partial to ours and our approach, um, and that's, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about here today. Um, but there are different ways, but, as a, you know, again, as a general rule, you should be monitoring the activity associated with high-risk positions actively, closely, um, regularly, and then with lower risk positions, you can take more of a passive approach um, and, and sort of sit back and say, I'm going to make sure that I know what's going on there, that I have information available to me if I need it, but it is lower risk. I don't need to be eyes on this activity all the time. Now, we at Spectrosoft, um, we, we think we're fairly unique in our approach because we have an active and passive option um, built into our solutions. Um, and, and we did this specifically because of insider risk. I and mean, what we found over time is that uh, companies, our customers, were comfortable deploying an active monitoring approach, um, you know, an area where 
digital activity you know, created by employees is being recorded, it's being stored in a central database, reports are being generated at, it's being reviewed. Um, they were comfortable doing that when they had a cause to do so. So if they had a reason to suspect, they would do that, or if they had uh, gone through the process of saying, well, that's a high-risk position and we're going to take a look at what they're doing, um, they would do that there. But they were uncomfortable um, deploying that type of approach where they didn't have that cause to do so. So either they didn't have a, a reason to suspect or they had assessed that this is a lower risk position. Um, but as Dominique had talked about a little bit earlier and as we're going to talk about a little bit more, risk appears in places that you don't necessarily expect it. Um, so we had customers coming to us and saying, if, don't, you know, if only there was a way to, to do this in a slightly different approach, and we came out with a passive monitoring approach that you know, still records all that same activity that's being recorded by our, our active monitoring approach, but the data is not available for review. No one's in there looking at it. It's kind of being logged and stored, and then we can spin some alerts off of it to help people understand perhaps if cause is materializing. So we have those two approaches, and, and that passive approach is really designed to allow companies to, to, to seek out blanket coverage. We talked about applying things consistently earlier, and I think that that's important. You don't want to single people out. Um, but you also need to acknowledge that we don't know when risk may elevate. And so if you have, you know, some activity history available when it becomes apparent that it is elevating, you're ahead of the game. So, so that's a, a look, and we've talked a lot about the beginning of the employee life cycle. Let's shift a little bit and, uh, and, and walk through the middle, because um, I think that there's a lot of interesting things that happen in kind of the middle of that employee life cycle. And inside the middle, it's not all you know, kind of status quo. And I think a lot of folks would look at it and say, well, we've gone through all the effort, we've assigned the risk levels, we know what we're dealing with, um, we're good. Um, but in addition to positional risk and, and kind of people risk, there's this conditional risk, reasons why risk may elevate. Um, so Dominique, can you kind of walk us through you know, some of the things that, that may occur that would shift a risk profile inside a company. Absolutely. With those two conditions in the person's life cycle, we have the status quo and we have the elevated risk. During the status quo, you know, you've assigned the risk association with the position. You've screened carefully. You've put the proper, you know, accesses in place. You have appropriate levels of security, which we just talked about, and you're all set unless, unless what, conditions change. Um, the pulse of the person, their life changes, there could potentially be financial risk, so there's more apt for them to commit fraud. Um, security and IT might not have that insight, um, but HR does have access because things may get flagged, whether it's someone taking um, a large 401k withdrawal, um, whether we know that there is um, uh, they're in default or bankruptcy, things of that sort that get flagged through payroll, garnishments, things of that sort that really have changed someone's personal life that we have insight to and can work very closely with IT and security to notify them that potentially their this risk level will be changing based on information that we have insight to that not necessarily security IT would have to. Um, back in the day when uh, at one of my previous companies, um, we had an individual salesperson, uh, HR knew that the person was having um, personal problems, but what translated into is the communication that this person ended up falsifying POs, uh, was paid out a lot of commissions, and he was working with an outside partner. Um, so here we are in a situation that the communication was not there, but HR knew that things were going on from a personal standpoint, and there has to be that really that communication, that connection, and that comes back to tying back relationships that are built within these different departments. No, yeah, well, that's excellent insight, and I think one of the reasons why why we wanted you to join us today uh, on this webinar was to was to share some of the perspective that HR can bring that can really help the folks charged with keeping a company secure um, because of the information you might have access to. Um, I think there are also things inside a company that can occur that can help change somebody's risk profile, and let's let's walk through that a little bit. So, um, so what you're looking at here, that's that's your company, and those are your employees. And today is a really good day for Steve. Steve just got found out that he got promoted to run his department. 
So Steve's having hey. a good day, um, and it's a good thing. This is the kind of thing companies announce internally, promoting your own people. It's a great, great day. Um, the, the other folks here highlighted here are kind of the folks that Steve are most close to in the company, he works closely with. Um, they may be his friends, his close coworkers, um, some of his peers. Well, Steve's very happy, but Joe is not because Joe really does not like Steve, and Joe just found out he works for Steve. And Joe was thinking, boy, I don't think I can work for this guy. I may need to go find another job. This is a terrible day. Um, and then we're looking at Sally, and Sally is really ticked off because Sally applied for the same promotion that Steve got. She wanted to run that department, and she knows she's more qualified than, than Steve is. So she is very angry, and she is done with this place. Um, so now you know, we've, take, we've seen a good thing inside a company um, can be perceived differently by other people um, you know, based on their perspective and how that change can affect them. What are, Dominique, what are some of the other factors that can kind of change how risk presents inside a company? Well, to piggyback real quick on, you know, the comment about, you know, Steve getting promoted, he's very excited. I think sometimes we, as an organization we fail to, to recognize that there are other people that are going to be impacted and who are not going to be happy and they're going to be disgruntled. Um, the woes me, why wasn't it me, whether they're performing or not, they are just going to question it, feel that it was them. And realistically, that's where it leads into a potential threat is it's going to be that particular person that, that, is, that you may not know is angry because they may be an introvert. Um, it's those that you're not going to know because your extroverts, they are going to tell. You're going to hear about it through the, you know, um, they're going to either communicate with their manager, with their friends, through the rumors. But it's the quiet one specifically that now that time, you know, that risk level has escalated. Um, employees are disgruntled in other ways too. They get a bad review. Um, you know, their annual review, quarterly review, um, they're put on a performance plan and act surprised as if it wasn't, you know, realistic that they weren't performing. Um, and it could be as easy as a verbal warning where it's a communication or even a counseling. And we have, you know, instead of an employee turning it around to make something positive out of it, um, they're now angry and it could hurt the organization. Um, how about the person that didn't get that promotion or that someone feels they're getting preferential treatment? Um, unfortunately, these days, litigation has increased significantly, um, and they, do, they think that, you know, someone else is getting that special treatment. Or how about if somebody feels that their boss is on their case and it's not about them but their boss is having a bad day or that, you know, they just feel that their boss is always on them. Or if a coworker is let go. I mean, all of these reasons are ways that employees, you know, are disgruntled. But we have to be able to prevent these things first before they even get to that. Um, and when there's, you know, significant uncertainty or when rumors are circulating, a reduction in force. Um, unfortunately, especially if organizations aren't communicating to their employees, no matter how great in revenue that they're doing, um, it only takes a pocket full of employees regardless of the size of your company. A large organization, you just need one person to start in the division or a small organization to, you know, say that there's uh, positions are going to be eliminated, um, hours are going to be reduced. Um, all of these, you know, factors drive the end of the employee's life cycle. And, you know, you have to get ahead of that before that even happens. Yeah, so let's, you know, we'll go back and take a look at what some of the experts say to do in these situations. So, you know, going back and, and referencing back to the, the folks at the Insider Threat Institute with Carnegie Mellon, um, you know, the, these, these bullets up on the screen are taken directly from their advice. Um, and, you know, and their advice is to enhance monitoring of employees that have a personnel issue going on. You know, certainly in accordance with policy and law, um, enable additional auditing and monitoring controls, um, you know, that are outlined in policies and procedures, meaning you needed to prepare for this in advance. Um, but they're, you know, they're clearly saying you need to take a closer look and you need to keep a closer eye on people that are going through the types of things that Dominique just talked about. And, and really, you know, there, there's a parallel to, to risk inside the company. Um, and, and you can kind of look at a risk forecast not unlike the weather, right? And, and for any of you that have ever, um, you know, listened to a local weather person and were convinced it was going to be a sunny day uh, and then went out and got caught in the rain without an umbrella, you know, that you can predict the weather, but not 100%. And you can predict risk, but not 100%, um, because things do change, circumstances change. We don't want to get caught without a plan to deal with insider risk if it's starting to metastasize into insider threat. 
Um, so real quick poll here. Um, do you alter your internal security during periods of elevated risk? So some of the things that Dominique was just talking about, um, does your company go in and alter your internal security, start to, to monitor, no matter what methodology you're using, a little bit more closely the folks that are involved in that, in that sort of elevated risk? And, Dominique, what, what do you think we're going to get as an answer here in terms of a percentage? I think it's going to be low. I don't think that it is going to be changed because I'm not sure how much communication is happening between the different departments for IT and security to know that there is an elevated risk. So I think it's going to be low. Yeah, I agree. So we should be seeing some results here momentarily. And the, the predictions from where we sit are going to be a, a So there we go. So it is certainly lower than what we saw earlier, uh, higher than I would have guessed. Um, I would have guessed for sure. But, but so there we have the answer. So, um, so for the for the let's call it half of you that are doing this already, well done. Um, that, that's, that's, that's excellent. Impressive, uh, yeah. I'm impressed by that. So as we move forward, you know, Dominique, do you want to talk a little bit about? You, you talked about the information you have access to. Um, in HR and the communication. We wanted to talk a little bit more about that here. Yep. Here's a great opportunity for HR and IT security to work closely together um, to improve the security and reduce the risk. But how do we do that? We do that by having the job descriptions, having the details, um, having a way to uh, communicate to IT and security a way without having to give away personal details. Um, so if it's a person who has an access of, let's say, on a scale of 1 to 10, um, they have a risk level of a 5, but all of a sudden there's a new risk condition that exists that HR is aware of, um, they can communicate back to IT and say, red alert, John Smith is now a 9. And we have to be able to communicate to you without giving that information away because potentially there could be an investigation involved, something that may end up uh, working together legal or in the courts, um, and to not implicate and bring, you know, additional people in, here's a great way to be able to monitor the, the folks, make, you know, and assess the risk, elevate it, and then revert back to a 5 when it's like systems go, okay, back to what their original risk level is. And that's really, really important. Um, Mike, what do you think? Additional thoughts on how that could work? No, I think, I think those are great points, and it, and it kind of crystallized what you just said, the, the difference between status quo and elevated risk and how it can even shift back to status quo. Um, so, I, so I think that those are, those are excellent points. And I think that kind of brings us to the end of the middle, if you will. So we talked about the beginning of the life cycle and the middle, and so now we're, we're at the, uh, the end of the employee life cycle. And you'll notice that that is now in red, um, and there's a reason for that. So when people are getting ready to leave the company, there's a lot of risk associated with that. And the term that I use is the high-risk exit period. The words up on the screen, you know, once again, are from the great people over at the CERT, uh, Carnegie Mellon team. Um, that's from a paper called A Pattern for Increased Monitoring for Intellectual Property Theft by Departing Insiders. Um, I would encourage anybody interested to go out and download that. It's an excellent read. But what are we talking about with this high-risk exit period? So I'm going to try to, to walk you through this quickly outside of uh, – outside of corporate world. So let's say you were going to have a party, um, and you're going to have that party at your house. You have a pretty nice house, and you're going to invite some people over to your house. And let's just say, for argument's sake, you got 10 people coming to your party. Well, in that house, pretty nice house that you have, you have some nice things. You have grandma's silverware that she left for you. Uh, maybe you have an old baseball card or two lying around, a nice collection there. Maybe some nice jewelry. So, you know, these are the kinds of things that you want to keep, you want to hang on to, you want to protect. Well, if you were to find out, you know, say now, right now, that of the ten people that you've invited to your party, five of them think it's completely okay to take something with them when they leave the party. little souvenir, something to remember the party by, something they may want to use later, I need new silverware. What would you do? I submit that you would absolutely, if you have the party at all and do not immediately start getting new friends, you would go out and keep a closer eye on the folks with the keys in their hands. 
Um, huh. and, I, and I don't think anybody would do anything differently than that. Well, you know, getting past that and bringing it back into the corporate world, that's what we know. Um, you know. We know that one out of every two employees surveyed say that they think it's okay to take something with them, corporate data, when they leave. 51% of the people in a, in a survey by Symantec, 48% in a survey that we did. Um, in that Symantec survey, 18% of people admitted to stealing corporate intelligence. And I, I think we all know people well enough to know if 18% admitted it, a higher number did it, because most people aren't going to aren't, aren't going to admit to that. So, so Dominique, if the if the employee party, the life cycle is winding down and the keys are in hands, what should be done? Risk level 10, red alert, alarm bells going off. Uh, whether it's termination, whether they're being terminated, whether it's a resignation, how about a rumor? Or how about a rumor when behavior changes? Uh, some things that, from a coaching standpoint, when I'm mentoring our executives and our department heads, is look for clues when things have changed with the employee. Is their desk all of a sudden extremely clean when they've been with you for, you know, several years and they've had their pictures of their family or they've had a messy desk because they're always working and all of a sudden um, they have a clean desk? How about they come in casually and all of a sudden now they're coming with a button-down shirt and pant, dress pants that are pressed? I mean, these are certain cues that you pick up. So realistically, it could be, you know, by termination, by resignation, or by behavior changes. So if someone's leaving, that risk level should be a 10, you know, that's when HR has to communicate to IT and security as soon as that, for example, that resignation is received or even suspected. Uh, if, a if a termination decision has been made, it is to notify IT and security immediately. Um, so that way they're prepared and you start monitoring what they're doing. Because, you know, surveys have said that it take, typically takes 30 days out um, that an employee um, is, is, is potentially going to be having activities that are going to hurt the organization. So at the, termina at the termination process, okay, at the end of the life cycle, what do we do? We review our confidentiality and our IP agreements with the employee immediately. Do they have the non-compete? Remind them during that exit interview, um, you know, that at that resignation or termination, that they to abide by these. Um, you know, again, it's monitoring and, and um, uh, their online activities leading up to that termination date. Yeah, I, I think it's a great point. And one thing I'd touch on on this real quickly, um, I, I think a lot of confidentiality and IP agreements are a little bit dated. And I, if you go back and look at yours, a lot of them say that employees must return information when they leave. And given how everything is bits and bytes now and how easy it is to move data around, it really needs to say return and destroy. And so, you know, quick tip, if, if you get a chance, go back and look and make sure you've added the words and destroy into your, your IP agreements because it really is important. But the other stuff you want to do, and you touched on it, Dominique, is if you want to take a look at employees' activity um, for the 30-day period leading up to termination. And that's not a made-up date. You know, that comes out of models that, that have been run out of CERT um, and out of survey information. And then this is really, this is the high-risk exit period. Um, and, and you're going to see the bulk of activity, if people are taking data with them, um, happens in the 30 days before they give notice. Um, or if you're dealing with somebody who thinks that perhaps they're at risk of being terminated in the 30 days when, you know, when they think that's happening, somebody that's put on performance plan, those types of things. Um, so you want to review their online activity for the 30-day period leading up to the termination date. Um, and if you can get to the 30 days before they gave notice of resignation, you're going to be doing much better, and I would recommend that you do that. Now, that can be a daunting process when you start to think about all the things you would need to look at. Um, and that's, you know, one of the reasons people come to us for customers. You know, a little bit about what Spectrosoft, Spectrosoft does, excuse me. Um, you know, we record what people are doing with the IT resources they've been given. Um, so you can see up on the screen here the, the breadth of online activity that we can capture. Um, and we've done, a, we've done this for a long time, as you know, and we're quite good at it. Our, uh, our data has been tested and our methodology has been tested multiple times and it has always held up. 
Um, so you're going to you're going to have a an accurate and complete record of what someone was doing, and you're going to be able to see um, not only um, you know did they access a file or something like that, but you'll be able to see that in the context that they did it because you see a much more richer picture of what an employee's activity was if you have things like screenshot recording, which I would tell you in that high risk exit period you want to have on because you can see exactly what was done. So we can collect all this information and have it in one place for you. And as we talked about a little bit earlier, it can be done both actively and passively. Um, you know, great that we have the information, but the key is now that you're at a time where you need to you need to pull the information out. You know, you need a, a, a way to do that quickly. You don't want to have to be offlining a lot of folks. Um, you know, I've walked into into um, IT offices in the past and say, hey, I need you to drop everything because we need to do an investigation. And I watch, you know, the, the longing looks up at the whiteboard and the things they thought they were going to get done that day go out the window. Um, so having all that information collected in a central location is great. Being able to access it in a way that's easy to use, easy to understand is equally important. And, and we have spent quite a bit of time on making it easy to see things like that DVR style playback that I referenced earlier, where you can really see things that are happening in context, but also being able to go in and search across all activity, for example, um, for specific words or phrases. And that can be, that can be things that appear in, uh, in um, system prompts as well. So if you wanted, you wanted to look for things like that, um, you can really see everything that an employee has done. You'd be able to see information being uploaded to cloud storage. Um, and how that has changed over time, emails being sent out. Keep a particular eye on emails going off domain and a particular eye from within that subset of emails going to webmail accounts like Gmail or, um, you know, if you're old school like me and use a Rocketmail account um, because that's, a, a, you know, a very common way for people to, to, to pull data out. So we, we can collect the information. We can make it easy for you to, uh, to see it and access it. And, you know, I wanted to just put up on the screen here really quickly. We talked in, on high-level terms about passive monitoring and active monitoring. Um, you know, as, as you're out and, and if, you're, if you're starting to look at this and, and to figure out what approach you want to take to help you deal with insider risk, our passive employee monitoring solution is called Spectre 360 Recon. It's an industry first. Um, Recon is, is the product that's been winning a lot of the awards lately, um, and this is the one that's going to let you log and alert on employee activity, um, but doesn't require a lot of back-end infrastructure, doesn't require uh, the eyes on it. This is what you'd use on your lower risk positions and lower risk times. Um, under active employee monitoring, we have two flavors, uh, two solutions for you. Spectre 360 is the flagship product that I referenced, uh, I think, on the first slide. You know, over 7,000 companies use Spectre 360. Um, it's a very powerful monitoring tool. Uh, all that data that we collect is written to a secure SQL backend that's on your premises, and it's going to provide you with that insight and level of detail into what somebody's doing. And this is the solution you want for, you know, high-risk positions, um, certainly, and then during that high-risk exit period. Um, Spectre c and &E Investigator is a lighter weight tool, um, very popular with smaller businesses, doesn't have that big SQL backend uh, requirement. So if you're, if you're a smaller company, that would be the flavor that I would point you to there. And then over on the, on the right-hand side, SpectreSoft Server Manager is kind of a classic security and event log monitoring tool, which is, you know, an excellent first step down the road towards making sure you have a good eye on employee activity. So those were the, the topics that we hope to cover today. Um, you know, I, I think we'll, we'll have a, a couple of minutes here for Q&A, but before we get to that, um, we wanted to leave you with, with some action items uh, and encourage you to take them. So we have a couple of new free resources available um, for you on the website that's uh, listed up there on the page. Um, we've released a white paper today um, dealing with the end of the employee life cycle. And, uh, and helping people with some best practices around that. And, and Dominique was involved in helping us to create that, as well as talking to some other folks in different, uh, different areas, not only of our company, but other companies. Um, and I think it's a, it's a valuable guide and a nice starting point. Um, we have another white paper up there called Implementing an Employee Monitoring Program. Um, and this one kind of helps you step through the process should you decide to go down the road um, of, of how you can get that done and answer some of the questions that people naturally have when they start to look at technology like ours. Um, there's trials available for both the active and passive Spectre 360 and Spectre 360 Recon solutions. But then we wanted to do something for the folks here 
Um, so if, you, if you're on the phone live today, um, not for the people that listen to this later when it's recorded, sorry, um, we're going to make available to you two free licenses of that Spectre c and &E investigator tool. And they're, they're term licenses. They're going to work for 60 days after you install them. Um, and, and we'll get them to you in a follow-up email. And, and we wanted you to have those because, you know, we, we do see a lot of bad things happening when, as employees leave the company, some of it inadvertent, some of it malicious. And I think, you know, if you have a couple of licenses to sort of test out the next couple of times this happens, um, you know, see if you get some value out of this um, and, and take a look at really actively monitoring um, the people with the keys in their hands, if you will. So that was the uh, – that was the – the, the topics we wanted to cover, and I think we have a few minutes here for some questions. So, so Danielle, I'm going to turn it back to you for, uh, for a little Q&A. Great. <clears throat> Great. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Um, we'll go ahead and jump in since I already see we have plenty of questions that have come in. Our first one is, are there organizations that have risk-level designations in place based on job roles? Now, that's a good question. And, um, and so the answer is yes, and I think we saw that a little bit in, in the polling earlier. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I was reading something the other day, um, and, it, and it was a, a document out of a government agency, and they, uh, they have a very formal process for assigning risk levels to positions and procedures associated with that, and it's, it's very well developed and well documented. Um, and it got me thinking a little bit, and, you know, they were clearly driven by, by the changes, um, you know, to, to national security and, and the steps that were taken now. Um, you know, both post 9/11 and post Snowden, um, and 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 I thought, you know, look at look at the work the government has done here. And, let, and let's face it, the government is probably a little more bureaucratic than anybody here would would want to put in place. But they, they certainly had the right idea, um, and I think there's a lot of things that could be translated out. Um, so there are absolutely organizations that are doing it, both from the attendees on the phone here today, and then um, you know, there, there's information out there about how how different organizations and entities are doing it as well. That's a good question. All right, great. Um, our next question is, can you predefine monitoring policies in your products so if an employee just resigned, you can monitor them, monitor them more closely? Um, Dominique, you want to take them? No, she's making a face at me. Um, so the answer is yes. Um, so the, the answer is yes that you can. And it, it's actually very easy in the solution not only to define um, you know, different monitoring profiles or policies, that could be readily applied to someone as a situation changes. Um, but you can also have triggers inside of that. So if a certain activity occurs, uh, you could increase, let's say, um, the frequency of screenshot recording. Um, so those are easy to do. And then the other piece here that we have that sort of aligns to that is we also have um, within the product dashboards that can be made available to different people inside the company. So you, you could take a dashboard um, say, for everyone that is in that high-risk exit period and make that dashboard available to your HR folks um, so that they, they don't have to weed through the whole product to go look for information, but they can, they can see the information relevant to them and relevant to that high-risk uh, exit period from their desktop. And that can be done for, for any number of different things that you might be monitoring for. It can even be done for, um, since we're talking about HR, for kind of classic HR issues. You might want alerts going to, to HR for inappropriate workplace behavior, um, and that can, that can be easily done both through alerts and through dashboards. So, so yes, you can, set up a, you can set up kind of pre-ready templates within the product. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, the next question is, uh, they claim you are saying these are common issues, I guess the insider threat um, issue, um, but have either of you been in a situation where a departing employee caused the company harm? Um, actually, I have, I've got a great story. Um, so one of my previous companies I worked for, uh, being responsible for internationally, um, was a uh, EMEA office in our London. Uh, it was our London office. And it was a sales rep who um, had been let go. And unfortunately, we ended up hearing that from one of our partners at a show that this particular employee was trying to sell off a USB drive with all of our uh, customer information. So do we really want to rely on hoping, again, that hope plus trust equals strategy, do we want to rely on that, that you have a great partner, a reseller, that's going to pick up the phone? Um, she was literally trying to sell off the data. Um, and so, yeah, that it does happen. And if you're not watching what the employee is doing, you know, it could be extremely detrimental to a company. 
and we were able to salvage it back because we had the police go to her, you know, to go to her home, and, uh, you know, she was abiding by the confidentiality agreement, and, you know, she had to turn everything over. We were pressing charges. And thankfully, nobody had bought that USB drive, and we were able to get it back. Yeah, yeah, and you know, I've certainly seen some things throughout my career as well, but the two things that come to mind here, um, you know, one is that, that these types of problems um, present at companies regardless of the size. I have a, a relative, pretty close relative, um, who's a private practice accountant, and uh, he had an incident uh, several years ago now where, where he had a, a bookkeeper who left and went to work for another accounting firm on the other side of town, and, and happily, you know, my relative had a pretty good relationship with his customers because he started to get calls saying, you know, this, this other accounting firm is calling our, calling us at home or on our cell phones and, and trying to convince us to move our business over to them. And he was able to pretty quickly figure out that his entire customer list walked out the door on her last day at work and ended up with, you know, what he didn't realize was actually a competitor because um, they were coming after him. And that's a very small company. You know, you're talking about being able to count the number of people on it one one hand. On the flip side, you know, we have customers that, uh, that, that share with us stories, uh, really shocking, you know, and in a good way, I guess, depending on your perspective, of the things that they've been able to detect and deal with um, through the use of our technology. We, we have a, you know, I've heard, um, I'm a little limited in what I can share, but I, I have heard about nine-figure uh, recovery, um, you know, nine figures. It's in the hundreds of millions of dollars, um, you know, when, when information related to a person who left a company um, and went to a competitor. Um, mm -hmm. And, and we, we were able to help uh, for them to pin that down and get into like a nine-figure type of, you know, recovery award. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, very common problems uh, regardless of company size. Okay. Um, we have a question, I guess, about legal considerations. The question is, is a company required to provide notice to employees um, that are being monitored? Uh, it's an excellent question, and, and, you know, and one of the reasons why we recommended earlier to, to, to have legal at the table. But, so I, I can answer this. Um, in the United States, and I, and I don't know the, the geographic locations of everyone on the phone, so I'm going to speak to the United States because that's where I am. Um, and I'm going to be the ugly American right now. Um, it is absolutely a best practice to notify your employees. Um, for the most part, I don't think it's a hard requirement, but, you know, putting the legal aspects aside, you're certainly safe legally, right, if you, if you disclose to people that they don't have an expectation of privacy when they're operating on company electronic resources. Um, so you certainly can't hurt yourself legally that way. But then, you know, stepping beyond that, it, it's kind of also an issue of um, respect with your employees, right? You know, don't don't have employees believe that something they're doing is private um, if it's not. And there, you know, we have things built into our technology to help strike a balance on that. You know, starting with that passive technology approach, um, but also being able to decide, you know, kind of what types of activity you want to record. Those those things I had up on the slide earlier you don't need to record all of them all the time for all the people. Um, and there are ways, you know, to do certain things. The example I like to use is um, probably no good coming from you knowing what's going on in an employee bank account on a regular basis. Um, so just, you know, don't monitor online activity when they go to online banking sites. And I bet, you know, the vast majority of your employees are using direct deposit, so you know which banks they go to. Just don't record activity on those sites. So those types of things are woven through the products. Don't collect online passwords. You know, it's rarely about what is somebody's Facebook password. Is it, I haven't heard the use case for, for uh, somebody needing that one just yet. So. And an easy way to address um, is through even your employee handbook. So if someone comes on board day, you know, day one, they're offered their employee handbook, work with your legal department to intertwine that verbiage um, that is going to come from IT, you know, the IT security side that, to protect the interests of the company. And it's very simple. It does not have to be a 10-page document that's, you know, woven into your employee handbook. Yep. But I think, you know, to, to kind of directly answer the question, at least in the U.S., and things get a little bit different um, in, in different countries, as, as long as the employee doesn't have an expectation of privacy, you're going to be fine. Um, Disclosure is probably being done by your company right now. Um, in every company I've worked on, I have to acknowledge something when I log on in the morning, um, and in that verbiage is uh, is usually something that says that the company 
you know, monitors or records or logs online activity. Um, so good question. Good question. Got it. Uh, well, unfortunately, very interesting discussion. Um, we do have to wrap up now, but I do want to extend a big thank you to you, Mike, and Dominique for your insight today. Um, great session. Of course, thanks to all of our listeners for tuning in. Uh, this webcast will be available on demand beginning tomorrow on the SD Magazine website. So until then, please join us next time. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.